Good morning, everyone. Good morning, welcome. Thank you for typing your name into chat. That's a big help to me. Thank you. Looks like just about everybody's here. We got a couple more people coming in. We'll give them a minute or two. It's good to see everybody this morning. I hope you all are doing well. Today we're having kind of an unusual day. We're not gonna be talking specifically about techniques in the lab or um, certain types of media that we use or anything like that. We're gonna be talking sort of informally today about a virus. Um, in your lecture topics this week is the topic of acellular microbes. Um, in other words, the kinds of microbes, things we consider to be microbes that don't meet our technical definition, things that are not actually alive, but are par particles of matter, but can cause disease. So we include them as microbes. And that includes the viruses and a type of particle called a prion. So today, um, sort of as a, um, a supplement to that lecture, we're gonna talk a little bit about the structure and the features of a virus that has had the entire world's attention for the last year. We are just about up to a year since the very first lockdown happened. Um, of course, it's now believed that the virus that causes COVID-19 was circulating a few months prior to that. Um, it wasn't until March that we started to see um, lockdowns. We started to see people sent home from work and school and starting to isolate, um, socially distance, wear masks, things like that. It's hard to believe sometimes that it's only been a year. It sometimes it feels like it's been much longer than that. It's been a very difficult period for a lot of us, for most of us, I would argue. Um, very stressful, very disruptive. Um, and of course it's had a terrible, terrible toll um, in terms of the number of people who are ill with it, who have been ill with this virus or who have died. Um, if you're not aware, we are over 26 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 in our country alone. And unfortunately, we are also now over half a million deaths from the virus since, it, um, since we first started looking for the virus and recording those deaths. So there's been a terrible, terrible toll from this pandemic. Um, and as I'm sure you're all aware, there's all kinds of information uh, sort of circulating on social media and just in other places on the internet and on news sites and on, uh, there's all kinds of information and a lot of it is misinformation. Um, even people who are really well intended and who wanna put good information out often don't report things correctly. And as a result, um, lots of people are misinformed about this virus and the risks of this virus. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of that has led to our very high case numbers and our very high death numbers compared to other countries around the world. So today we're gonna just talk a little bit about this virus since you are learning about these microbial acellular particles called viruses. Um, before I jump into our slides today, I did wanna um, just remind you that I sent an announcement out yesterday. If you didn't catch it, please look for it after our class today. I sent out an announcement about checking on your grades. Um, we're now at the point in the course where um, I try to let up a little bit on um, sort of following you <laughs> and making sure that you're getting your work done on time. 
Um, so from this point on, what I'm going to do, if an assignment does not get submitted on time, um, I'm going to enter a zero into the grades for it. Remember, you do have a week in this course past the due date to submit an assignment to me. Now, depending on the circumstances, I may take points off for late submission, but um, you can submit your work late. So uh, what I want you to get in the habit of doing now is looking at your grades and making sure that everything you think you've handed in, you actually handed in. Um, if you don't see a grade or if you see a zero for a grade, um, if there's a zero, especially, that means I, I just didn't get anything from you. Um, you can check in Blackboard on your end to make sure that you have submitted the work that was assigned to you. So that's what you need to um, sort of stay on top of now. Now, in the announcement, I also said that I have graded everything up to the lab practical exam that you took for me on Monday. So the lab practical is not completely graded yet. I've only just started into those. So you won't have necessarily have a grade for the lab practical, but you should have a grade for everything that came before that. All of the lecture quizzes, all of the lab questions, you should be able to see a grade for the work that you submitted, um, if you submitted it to me. Now, um, remember if there's ever a time when you are unable to complete work on time because of some issue going on, please let me know. Um, I am more than happy to work with you and grant you an extension um, and give you a few extra days if you need to um, take those. I would much rather that you hand your work in late than not hand it in at all. Um, remember every point, every point matters. <laughs> every point goes towards your course grade and every point is valuable. So, um, so yes, uh, make sure you keep up with your uh, grade list in Blackboard. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now with you and pull up some slides that I made for us to talk about today. And I think the way I'm going to handle it today, because we do have some limitations with Zoom and, and streaming, um, I'm going to ask you to um, type into chat for me today. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions um, or maybe uh, your opinion about certain things. And um, I might ask you to type into chat, or I might call on someone and ask them to unmute themselves um, and speak to us about um, a certain topic. So, um, so go ahead and open up your chat if you haven't, um, and we'll go ahead and get started. All right. So on the top of your screen right now, you should see a slide in the center that says SARS-CoV-2. And of course, this is the name of the virus that has been the cause of this pandemic that we've been dealing with um, for the past year or so. So the very first thing I wanna do is just throw it open and ask, what do you know about this virus? So what are some of the things, sort of the, maybe the structural things or the functional parts of this virus or any of the characteristics of this virus that you happen to know? Um, and just go ahead and type it right into chat for me and I'll read these out for us so we can talk about it. So Brianna's saying, for example, it's a respiratory virus and, um, Emily is talking about what the vaccine targets, the, the vaccine that we're all so grateful is available now. Um, and Brooke is talking about um, how some people are more predisposed to getting very ill from this virus than others. And that's right. Um, Amelia is asking about uh, flagella on the outside of this virus. That's a great question, Amelia. There actually aren't any flagella on this virus. There are these strange projections coming off the surface that we call spike proteins. Um, but yeah, it's the spikes on this virus that actually bind to human cells 
and cause the um, allow for the virus to get into the cell? That's a good question. Uh, Leanne's talking about mutations. Yes, this virus, like all viruses, has undergone some mutation events over this past year, and we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, Chelsea's talking about the genetic material in the virus, a single stranded molecule of RNA, that's right. And Amanda's talking about the incubation period, about two to 14 days. So in other words, after you get exposed to this virus, it takes up to a couple weeks before it will make you sick. Some people get sick very fast, but some people, it takes a while to incubate before we get sick. It's airborne, Mackenzie says. Yep, it's passed through the air. Yep. Um, Brooke has an interesting comment here. I heard that this virus will never go away. Uh, it's gonna be the new flu. <laughs> the truth is, Brooke, um, experts are not really decided on this yet. Um, we have some historical examples of both things. We have some historical examples of viruses that never go away. They just kind of get much less uh, common, things like influenza. And we also have historical examples of viruses that go away. And uh, the example of things that have sort of disappeared are both coronaviruses. So, we're not, we just don't know yet what's gonna happen to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Only time will tell us. Oh, and Emily's talking about this post-infection syndrome. This has been um, emerging as more and more people have had COVID, unfortunately. We're starting to see a syndrome appear in people that, um, leaves them feeling ill for months and months after they recover from the virus. Very, very serious condition, not well understood yet. Um, I'll tell you, anytime you hear the word syndrome in medicine, it means we don't understand it. We just don't understand it. It's a syndrome, it's a collection of symptoms and we can't readily explain why, why people have them. Um, and Amelia is talking about um, reinfection. There are some things that um, there are some people that believe that when you get COVID, you can then get it again months later. Now we have had some examples of this from around the world. Now these are what we call anecdotal examples. So just individual examples. We don't really understand this because it doesn't make a lot of sense that a human would be infected with something, recover from it, and then be vulnerable right away again. Because normally we make antibodies to fight off infections. And we would think that you would be safe at least for um, a, a significant period of time. So these reinfections we're not really clear on yet. There's some work going on to make sure that they are true reinfections, in other words, to confirm that the person really did have a positive test and then another positive test. Yeah, very, very scary, the idea that you could get reinfected so quickly. Um, yes. Loss of smell, yes, Brianna, what a strange symptom, right? One of the symptoms of, of this disorder that we call COVID-19 is, loss of, is uh, loss of smell. And it, it turns out to be a common symptom. So people report that after they become infected with it, they, they just lose their smell. I mean, I've never heard of a viral, another viral infection causing that. So actually that's quite a helpful symptom, right? Because um, it could alert people that they're probably infected and they need to go get tested. But what a strange, strange symptom. Yeah, Lacey's talking about these um, very strange reinfection cases. Um, three negative PCR tests. We're actually gonna talk about the different kinds of tests for this virus later, later in the semester. 
but um, the PCR test right now is considered the gold standard test. So people who come into the hospital um, with COVID, they get better, they test negative by PCR, and then they come back later and test positive again. We just don't know what's going on with those patients right now. Um, it could certainly be that they're getting infected with two different strains of this virus. Oh, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And of course, the other really unfortunate thing is that there are tests for this virus, including the PCR test, that are just not accurate. You've probably heard of this rapid test that we're using that's been produced by Abbott Laboratories. And this test is not very accurate. In fact, some have it at about 50-50. So, you know, you might as well flip a coin if it's a 50-50 accuracy rate to see if you have COVID. Um, the PCR test is much, much more accurate, but no test is 100% accurate. So it is possible for people to get an incorrect result. That's why we always test and retest and retest when something strange is going on. Yeah, um, it's gonna be a very interesting thing to learn about this virus, whether or not you can become reinfected so quickly. That's unheard of for other viral infections. Yeah, Cheyenne's also making a really good point here. One of the scary things about SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 is that we have seen that there aren't really good ways to predict who will have a mild case and who will have a very severe case and possibly a fatal case. Now, we certainly know a list of what are called comorbidities or concurrent diseases that people have that make them more vulnerable. For example, uh, we know that people who are morbidly obese tend to get COVID-19 more severely than people who are not morbidly obese. We know that elderly people tend to get this COVID-19 more severely than younger people. But I'm sure you have all seen stories of 20 year old people dying from the virus and even like 10 and five year old people. Um, there was a baby, a six week old baby who died of COVID. So we don't have those answers yet. We simply do not know why some people suffer so severely with it and other people don't. We also don't know why so many people get infected with it and don't get any disease at all. That's very unusual. We don't expect to see that with these viral infections. So yeah, we're gonna talk about these, these things. All right, good. So, it, so um, again, we've all learned a lot about this virus over the past year. We've also learned a lot about just, um, viruses in general. And we've learned a lot about things like disinfection and how viruses get transmitted and things like that. Um, whether we wanted to learn those things or not, we've kind of been forced um, to learn those things as we go. So I'm going to go into our slide set again now. And um, we'll start talking about some of the features of this virus. So you've all seen this image. If you have been watching any sort of uh, news sources during the pandemic, or um, you've had any exposure to any kind of uh, media, you've seen this image right here. So this is, um, this is what this virus looks like underneath an electron microscope. I'm gonna show you some actual images though. Um, this is a computer generated, computer modified image of this virus. Cause of course, the virus doesn't have colors like this. We don't, um, viruses don't have pigment like this. But what you can see when you look at this virus is that it's, it's spherical, it's round like a ball. And it has these strange projections sticking off of it. 
And these projections, again, are what we call spikes. Um, and these spikes happen to be the part of this virus that can bind to human cells and allow this virus to um, put its genetic material inside of the human cell. Remember, we defined microbes as being single-celled microscopic organisms or acellular particles. When we use that word organism, we're saying that the thing is alive. And so it has a certain list of features that make it alive. Um, we've talked in class about the things that all living cells share, the features that all living cells have. Viral particles are not cells. And so they don't have those features that living things have. They're not technically alive. They don't have the structures that they need to be considered a living cell. And they don't function the way living cells do. So we don't call them cells, we call them particles. And in the lecture this week, there's a definition, well, not really a definition, but a description of viruses given that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. So those three words mean different things to us. That word obligate means um, absolutely necessary. They are obligate intracellular parasites. Intracellular means inside of cells. And of course, a parasite is something that um, sort of lives off of something else, allows, uh, takes things away from some other living thing and can harm that other living thing. So this parasite, this viral parasite must get into a cell. It must, it's obligate in order, in order to get itself replicated, get itself reproduced or copied. Remember, it's not a living thing. It can't copy itself. It cannot reproduce itself because it's not alive. And the only way for something to persist, to stay present on planet Earth is for it to reproduce because all things, all materials degrade and decay over time. And viral particles are exactly the same. Um, if they didn't get reproduced, if they didn't get copied, they would just eventually all go away. So by getting into a cell, what we often call a host cell, these particles sort of hijack the cell and they get the cell to do the work of copying them and making more of them. It's a very interesting evolutionary strategy for viral particles. So, this SARS-CoV-2 virus, this pandemic virus, this is a coronavirus. That's the C-O-V in its name. There are many, many, many coronaviruses in the world. They are a big, big family of viruses. As we say, um, as we learn in the lecture this week, the way we name viruses is a little problematic. Because they're not living cells, they don't have a genus and a species like all other living things do. Instead, they get a name and the names are kind of all over the place in terms of where they come from. So the term coronavirus came from this term corona, which translates as crown. When you look at these spikes under the microscope, or when someone looked at these spikes, they thought it looked like a crown around this circular structure. And so they gave this virus the name coronavirus. So big, big family of viruses. We already know about a lot of them. 
There are coronaviruses, for example, that cause um, the common cold. There are coronaviruses that cause very severe respiratory infections. Um, there are lots of them. This one though, this one though is considered a novel coronavirus. You may have heard that term thrown around during the pandemic. This term novel just means new. So SARS-CoV-2 appeared on planet Earth <laughs> back probably in the late part of 2019. Um, we call it novel because we consider it to be a brand new coronavirus. Now, how do we know that it's brand new? How do we know when a virus is different from all the other coronaviruses? The answer is we look at its genetic material. When you take the genetic material out of this viral particle and you sequence it, in other words, you figure out the order of the bases in this molecule, this virus has only 70% homology with the most recently evolved coronaviruses. Now, what do I mean by sequence homology? The genetic material inside of uh, viruses is a much, much smaller molecule than in um, higher organisms like you and I. You and I have a DNA molecule in every one of our cells that has a nucleus in it. And that DNA molecule is very, very big, very long. Humans have about 3 billion, with a B, 3 billion individual pairs of bases in their DNA molecule. So very, very big molecule. Other organisms like bacteria, they have many fewer bases in their genetic material. In the DNA of a bacterial cell, for example, we typically expect to see maybe 4,000, 5,000 base pairs, pairs of bases in that DNA double helix. And remember, when I use this word base, I'm talking about the A's and the T's and the G's and the C's that you learned about that are in the DNA molecule and create this code that DNA possesses. Now, this SARS-CoV-2 virus doesn't have DNA. It has RNA, which is a very similar molecule. You and I also have RNA in our bodies but it's a very uh, short piece of RNA. And RNA, like DNA, has bases in it. And we can sequence those bases. We can figure out in the laboratory the order that those bases are in. And we can compare side by side the bases that are in other coronaviruses, the sequence, to this new coronavirus about 70% of those bases match. So that means 30% of the bases inside this new virus are different from all the other coronaviruses. 30%, that's a pretty big amount. This virus is considered new because it has a very different piece of genetic material in it than any other coronaviruses that we know about. Now we're gonna be talking later in the semester much more about genetic material and how microbes use their genetic material. The two most common, or I should say most, uh, not common, but most significant coronaviruses that have evolved recently in recent years are what's called the SARS virus and the MERS virus. So these are two other coronaviruses that emerged. They did not become pandemic. And remember pan means um, surrounding or global. So they did not spread all the way around the world, but they did spread locally. So we call those epidemics. So this one, SARS, created an epidemic in Canada and a couple other places um, 
SARS stands for something. It stands for severe acute respiratory syndrome. This is the disease that SARS caused in people. MERS emerged or appeared later, a couple years later, in a different part of the world, in the Middle East, but also caused a very similar, very serious, very sudden respiratory syndrome. So it got the name Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. So before SARS-CoV-2, in the early part of the 2000s, we saw two other brand new or novel coronaviruses um, evolve. They didn't become pandemics, but they gave us an idea that this virus was changing. And um, a lot of folks predicted that another coronavirus would emerge and perhaps create a pandemic. So this SARS-CoV-2 name stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus Type 2. So the reason they put the two on the end of that name was because they wanted to distinguish this virus from the other SARS virus. Because again, this virus is only 70% identical to that original SARS virus. This virus is new. Now, one of the questions I get a lot from students is, why does it matter that a virus is new? Why does it matter if a virus is old, in other words, has been on the planet for a long time, or is new, has never been on the planet before? And the answer is susceptibility. Viruses like influenza and um, polio and um, you know measles, viruses like that that have been around for a long time, they have infected a certain percentage of the world's population already. And some of them we have vaccines for. If you think about measles, uh, children in our country at least are routinely vaccinated against the measles before they go to school. So there's a percentage of the population for these older viruses who are immune, either because they've been infected, so they've developed a natural immunity, or because they've been vaccinated. So now they have a, an immunity from vaccination. Older viruses are not nearly as um, problematic for us because a lot of people around the world are already immune. When a new virus appears, the problem is no one is immune to it yet. It's brand new. So no one's immune system has ever encountered it and made antibodies against it. No one has ever been vaccinated against it. That's why new viruses have at least the potential to spread around the world very quickly because it has a whole globe of potential victims, potential hosts to infect. Now, of course, we're a year in and a lot of people have already had COVID and of course now we're vaccinating, which is wonderful. And the hope is that as we continue to vaccinate people here and around the world, this virus will just become yet another old virus that you know causes flare-ups from time to time, but is no longer pandemic, is no longer causing problems throughout the world. So let's say just a couple things about the viral structure for SARS-CoV-2. Remember, all viruses have a couple things in common. They all have some kind of genetic material in them. It can be DNA or it can be RNA. They also have protein in them. And 
a lot of viruses have their genetic material surrounded by a coating of protein that we call a capsid. Now viruses are simple, they're simple creatures. So capsids are usually only one type of protein or maybe two or three, but not you know the hundreds and hundreds of proteins that you would see, for example, in a cell membrane. They're very limited in the number of molecules that they're made from. Now in the lecture, we talk about how some people refer to the combination, the combination of the genetic material and the capsid, the protein coating. Some people call those two things together, the nucleocapsid. And that's probably a better word for this virus because inside of this virus, the capsid doesn't surround the genetic material so much as it's sort of integrated into the genetic material. It's sort of wrapped in and around the RNA molecule in there. Now, viruses do vary quite a bit in structure, right? They have all kinds of different shapes. Some viruses are spherical, like this one. Some have a polyhedral shape, so they're still round. They're still spherical, but they have flat sort of plates surrounding them instead of a nice smooth sphere. Some viruses are helical or rod-shaped, and some viruses just have very complex, unusual shapes. And um, the best example of a complex shape is the viruses that infect bacteria. And those viruses are called bacteriophages. Remember, every single life form on planet Earth is susceptible to viral infections. It doesn't matter if you're a bacteria or you're an archaea or you're one of the eukarya, you are susceptible to viral infection. Plants, animals, it doesn't matter. Everybody has their own viruses that they have to worry about. So viruses differ in their shapes. They differ in whether or not they have these spikes. Some viruses have um, a, a wrapping of membrane around them called an envelope. Some viruses even have proteins, preformed proteins inside where the genetic material is different from the capsid. In other words, not a structural protein that just surrounds the genetic material, but a functional protein, an enzyme, something that can do chemical reactions for the virus. Now, SARS-CoV-2 has spikes. It also has an envelope and it also has preformed enzymes, at least one that we know of in particular. I want to point out that the reason we call this gray thing on this virus, remember it's not really gray, but they've colored it gray in this picture. The reason we call it an envelope and not a membrane is because the virus didn't make this thing. Cells are surrounded by membranes. Cells make, they manufacture their membranes and they maintain them. Viral particles steal a little piece of membrane from the cells that they infect. Again, not all viruses have an envelope, but SARS-CoV-2, when it leaves its host cells inside of humans, it steals a little piece of the membrane from the cell and wraps itself in it. The spikes that come out of the envelope, those are viral. Those are coded for by the genetic material in the virus, but the envelope is not. This is a diagram of SARS-CoV-2. I like this picture because it labels some things for us. Now um, in the center here in purple, this represents the RNA molecule, the genetic material, as well as the capsid. Now, 
they've drawn the genetic material as the dark purple line, and they've drawn the capsid as the purple, light purple circles, sort of the lavender color. This is what I mean when I say that in this particular virus, the capsid doesn't surround the nuclear, uh, I should say, genetic material. Instead, it's sort of wrapped around it, protecting it by wrapping around it. The two molecules are sort of uh, twisted around each other. Now, this artist has this labeled as nucleoprotein instead of capsid. That's fine. That's just another term that people use. But we're going to learn the word capsid to describe the structural protein that is um, near the genetic material of a virus. You can see they've drawn the envelope again in gray. And they've also drawn in some proteins, just a couple of proteins in the envelope. You'll notice one of them is called M here. Another one is called E. There's um, probably maybe one or two more proteins, but we haven't um, really described them yet. This spike is also made out of protein. And this spike is often shorthanded as S. So when you hear people talk about the S protein in this coronavirus, they're talking about these spikes. Take a look at the images on this slide. These are images of SARS-CoV-2 that were taken with an electron microscope, because of course we can only see viruses with electron microscopes. Now, all of these images have been colorized. So again, the virus doesn't have any natural color in it, but they've colorized them here so we can see them a little better. When you look at this image on the upper left, I think you can see why somebody looked at this and thought of a crown. The way the spikes look right here, it makes it look like this is, it's got a crown on it. It's got this spiky sort of halo around it. So that's how it got its name, Corona, coronavirus. This is a much higher magnification image. Again, this is the envelope that you're looking at in yellow. And if you were to peel this away, you would be able to see the RNA and the protein inside. Again, the spikes around the outside have been colored red here. Now down on the bottom images, we're at a lower magnification. That's why the viral particles look so small here. I like these images though, because this one especially reminds us that viral particles are very, very small compared to cells. Remember the largest type of cells that we see are plant cells. The next largest are animal cells. Then comes the bacteria and the archaea. Animal cells are about 10 times as big as bacteria and archaeal cells, generally speaking. There are exceptions to that. But they are about a thousand or thousands of times bigger than viral particles. So everything you see here that's colored pink and blue in the background, we're looking at an area on a eukaryotic cell, an animal cell. So this thing is huge in the back. And these little yellow things, these are viral particles. So viruses are much, much smaller than cells. And this, again, this is just another EM image. I like this one because you can still see spikes coming off of these circular viral particles. Take a look at this image. This really drives that point home. This is a human cell. Now this cell is sitting in a dish in a laboratory. So it's been taken out of the body. And you can see that this is not a nice round cell that we might expect to see coming out of an animal. This cell has strange spiky things coming out of it. But everywhere that you see red or an orangey color, sort of a coral color, this is cell. 
we are looking at a eukaryotic cell underneath a scanning electron microscope. Remember, the scanning scopes only show us the surface. The transmission scopes show us the inside, but the scanning scopes only show us the surface. Every little yellow dot that you see here is a viral particle. And these happen to be SARS-CoV-2 viral particles. You can really get a sense of this cell being under attack right now, right? You really get a sense that it is just being attacked by this virus. And it is, it's absolutely being attacked. Now in the early days of this pandemic, because what we were seeing most in patients was a viral pneumonia. Scientists first imagined that this virus was gaining entry to the body through the cells that make up the lungs. And remember in the deeper parts of the lungs, in the alveoli, remember from your anatomy, you have specialized epithelial cells. Remember that? <laughs> I'm probably digging now, but remember there are four kinds of tissue in the body. There's epithelium, there's connective tissue. Hopefully you were, this is getting dusted off in your head. There's muscle and there's nerve. Only four kinds of tissue. And everything that covers surfaces in your body or lines cavities in your body, that's epithelium. So your lungs are lined with epithelium and they're specialized to help you exchange gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide. You also have a lot of blood vessels in your lungs, right? Because, because the epithelial cell is gonna get those gases from the bloodstream. So those two things have to be close together, the epithelial cell and the capillary so that the carbon dioxide can come out of your blood through the epithelial cell and you can breathe it out. And the oxygen can come across the epithelial cell and into your blood. So your lungs have a lot of capillaries in them, a lot of blood vessels. Lots of organs in your body are full of capillaries, right? Well, actually all organs in your body, <laughs> but there are some organs that are richer in blood supply than other organs are. Now, we originally thought the best place to look for where this virus was getting into cells was in the lungs. That made all kinds of sense. So we looked at those epithelial cells that line the lungs to see if that's what the virus was binding to. In the lecture, we talk about how in order for a virus to get into a cell, the very first thing that has to happen is the virus has to bind to a receptor on the surface of the cell. If it doesn't bind, it cannot get its genetic material into the cell. So we went on a hunt. Scientists went on a hunt early in the pandemic, trying to figure out which cell the virus was entering, what kind of cell, and what receptor it was using, what receptor it was sticking to, binding to. Only it turns out it, it's not the epithelial cells in the lungs. There's another kind of cell that this virus infects. Does anybody know? Anybody know what kind of cell SARS-CoV-2 binds to and infects? Any ideas? I don't think this is as common knowledge. I don't think they talk about this very much um, on the internet or on the news or anything. It's another kind of epithelial cell, but it's not the epithelial cells that line our lungs. This virus gets into the cells that line our blood vessels. This virus enters the endothelial cells. Endothelium is a special kind of epithelium 
that lines the inside cavity of your blood vessels. So your arteries, your veins, your arterioles and your venules and your capillaries. Endothelium, it's a specialized type of epithelium. And that's the kind of cell that this virus infects. So yes, it does come in to the lung through your nose, through your mouth, even a little bit through your eyes and it goes down into the lung but the cell that it's getting into so that it can get copied are the cells that line those capillaries in your lung. And it's damaging those cells. In fact, it's damaging endothelial cells all through the body, which is why we now know that this virus is not just a respiratory virus, right? What other symptoms do people sometimes get with COVID? Anybody know? Put it into the chat if you do. Have you heard of any other symptoms that people get other than we said uh, loss of smell, right? Have you heard of any others? Vomiting, yes, Brooke. And it's cousin, diarrhea, right? It's always vomiting and diarrhea when we talk about those. So gastrointestinal signs, yep. Headache, yes. Yep, stomach, so gastrointestinal, yep. Muscle pain, weakness. There's a whole range of symptoms that some people report, right? There have been um, all kinds of cardiovascular signs in some people, right? Some people have a heart attack when they get this virus. Arrhythmias, that's right, Amelia. Uh, night sweats, right, which would suggest again, a battle going on in the body, not just in the lungs. And again, the reason this is, is because this is not purely a respiratory virus. This is a vascular virus. And it is infecting the places in the body that are especially well supplied with blood. Yeah, Brianna wrote COVID toes. That's a great example. If you're not familiar with that phrase, a lot of people who have COVID and who are hospitalized for it, one of the signs that they develop sometimes is um, a terrible color change in their feet, specifically in their toes. And we think what's happening is they're losing blood supply in those little toes, those areas that are supplied by, again, capillaries. And as the blood vessels are infected, the endothelial cells, again, they're infected, they're damaged. There's a lot of inflammation in the area. Those blood vessels kind of close up. And as you know, if you can't get blood to your toes, your toes are gonna turn purple and then they're gonna turn black and then you're gonna lose them, right? So yeah, we are, um, we are losing um, the ability to perfuse when we're infected with COVID. We're not getting blood everywhere it needs to go. Um, heart attack, um, sick lungs, sick intestine. Some people develop um, signs associated with their liver. There's uh, cardiac signs. It depends on the person somewhat, which system is more affected. Some people are developing kidney, kidney diseases because the kidneys are very rich in a blood supply. So yeah, viruses, when they come into host cells to again, get themselves copied, and then they leave the host cell, they're damaging those cells. They're also triggering an immune response. We're gonna talk about the immune system later in the semester, but um, your immune system is very good at finding viruses and destroying them. That's how you get better, but Unfortunately, your immune system can also damage your own tissue in the process, right? The fact that, you know, when you get sick with the flu, the reason you get a fever, it's not from the virus, it's from your immune system reacting to the virus. The reason your muscles hurt, it's not the virus, it's your immune system reacting to the virus. So yeah, your immune system itself 
actually causes some of the tissue damage that's associated with this infection. So that's why you, you may have heard part of the treatment for the sickest patients is to try to calm the immune reaction down just a little bit with steroids. You may have heard that some of the sickest patients are getting a drug called dexamethasone. Uh, President Trump got dexamethasone when he was ill. Um, dexamethasone is a very powerful anti-inflammatory. It's a steroid. Um, and sometimes that's what the person needs. They need their immune system to quiet down just a little bit and not fight quite so hard because they're, it's damaging the tissue in the body. So yeah, this, this virus is um, different from many other coronaviruses in that it can affect all kinds of things in your body because it infects the cells that line your blood vessels. Now, once this virus gets into your endothelial cells as a human, what it's doing is it's putting its genetic material into the cell, by the way. So it's putting that piece of RNA, remember it's not DNA for this virus, it's RNA. In a living cell, in a living cell, RNA takes three different forms. And again, we're gonna talk about this in a couple of weeks. There's what we call messenger RNA or mRNA. Then there's a kind called ribosomal RNA. Remember that's found in the ribosomes. Then there's a kind called transfer RNA or tRNA. So three different types. It's the mRNA, again, messenger, that carries the code to build protein. Remember, that's what your DNA codes for. The code of bases that's in your DNA, all those genes in your DNA, contain the instructions to build a particular type of protein. So all different kinds of structural proteins and enzymes and so on are coded in your DNA. Your DNA is used to make RNA and then the messenger RNA is used to make protein. Now that's in a living cell. The viral RNA, we don't call messenger RNA or ribosomal or transfer because this is not a cell, it's just a particle. So it's just a piece of RNA in here. But when the virus injects it into a host cell, the host cell can't tell that it's viral. The host cell just sees a piece of RNA. And because of the way it's presented, because it's just loose in the cell, if you will, the host cell will treat it as though it's messenger RNA. The host cell can't tell where that RNA came from. It just looks like RNA. So the host cell says, oh, look, some messenger RNA. We better make some protein with it. And that's exactly what it does. It takes the viral RNA and it does a process called translation on it. Translation is the name of the process where an mRNA molecule is used to build a protein. It's a very clever system again, if you think about it, because the virus is taking advantage. The virus doesn't have to copy its own genetic material. It doesn't have to build its own proteins. In fact, it can't do that. So it puts its genetic material into a living cell and lets the living cell do that work. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this slide because we are going to talk about this later in the semester, but just as a reminder, DNA and RNA are both considered genetic material. They're both involved in our uh, system of genes that helps us make proteins. DNA is a double-stranded molecule. That's the double helix, remember. All cells use DNA as their genetic material, at least cells on planet Earth. 
Now, RNA is different. RNA is a single-stranded molecule inside of living cells. In a viral particle, all bets are off because it's not a cell. We can find double-stranded DNA in viral particles. We can find single-stranded RNA, but we can also find single-stranded DNA or double-stranded RNA in viruses. It really runs the gamut. The difference between these two molecules is not big, really. When you look at the molecule itself, when you look at the individual pieces of DNA, what we often call bases in DNA, there's just a few little differences between these two. The reason this is deoxyribonucleic acid is because it's missing an oxygen compared to RNA. See that little OH in the RNA molecule? Well, in DNA, it's just H. So it's a deoxy. It has lost an oxygen. Deoxyribonucleic acid. The other thing to know about it in terms of difference is that there is a difference in the bases. In DNA, there's thymine, cytosine, adenine, guanine, that's T, C, A, and G. In RNA, there is no thymine. There's a very similar molecule though, called uracil. This is the structure of thymine here. This is the structure of uracil. Look at the difference. Thymine just has this methyl group, CH3. Uracil just has a hydrogen, a singlet hydrogen. So very similar base, but different in DNA thymine, in RNA uracil. This image here, I'm actually not gonna talk about today, but you're gonna see this image in lecture. This is a really nice image for putting together this process called translation. Because what's happening in this image is a, a cellular machine called a ribosome, that's what's shown in gray here, is going to take a piece of messenger RNA, that's what's shown in black, and it's gonna decode it, it's gonna use it to build protein. That's what this yellow strand is right here. This is a strand built out of amino acids. And when you take a long strand of amino acids and you fold them all up, you get a protein. So translation is a process where ribosomes inside of cells use the RNA molecule to build a protein. Now, viral particles aren't cells. They don't have any ribosomes. They can't do any of this. They don't have any enzymes. They can't do any of this. So they put their MR or they put their RNA into a host cell and they let the host cell do it. So the host cell, which has ribosomes in it because all cells have ribosomes in them, the host cell is gonna decode that viral RNA and it's gonna build viral proteins. And inside the host cell, all those viral proteins are gonna reassemble and make new viral particles. And after being inside the cell for a certain period of time, now the host cell is gonna be jammed full of brand new viral particles. And those viral particles are gonna get out. Now, animal viruses typically go out through the membrane and take a little piece of membrane with them. That's the envelope. Other viruses are different. The viruses that infect bacteria, for example, they just burst out of the bacterial cell. They kill the bacterial cell. So, it is possible for human cells to be killed by viral particles inside of them, but not always, that doesn't always happen. So it's a brutal thing for the cell. The poor cell, the poor cell gets inundated and, and by its own ignorance, the cell 
builds viral particles. And those viral particles are gonna get out of that cell and they're gonna go find another cell to infect. They're gonna bind to the next endothelial cell. And the whole thing starts over again until pretty sure, uh, pretty soon, there's a lot of viral particles inside that person's body. The immune system is then gonna start to fight because the immune system is gonna see those viral particles as being foreign and it's gonna to try to destroy them. Um, let's see. On this slide, I just wrote down that COVID-19, which is the disease that SARS-CoV-2 causes, COVID means corona, virus, disease, and it was first described in 2019. That's why it has the 19 on it. COVID-19 is a vascular disease. It doesn't just cause respiratory symptoms. It can cause symptoms all over the body. The other thing I do wanna mention though, before we run out of time today, is how this thing gets into the endothelial cells. There's a receptor on blood vessel cells on these endothelial cells called ACE2. Now this stands for something, of course, it stands for angiotensin converting enzyme two, very long name. Now you know why everybody just calls it ACE2. This receptor is involved in some really important things that happen in blood vessels, including things like maintaining blood pressure and whether or not our blood vessels should be dilated or should be constricted. And I know you can't see this diagram very well from where you're, um, where you're viewing it, but this diagram is trying to show us that when this virus comes in through our mouth, and our nose and our eyes. It can infect all kinds of organ systems because it's coming in through blood vessels. So we need ACE2 receptor. We need it. It's located all through our blood vessels. It helps regulate our cardiovascular system. This virus is just taking advantage of it. This virus just happens to match the ACE2 receptor. So those spikes fit in the ACE2 receptor, just like a key fits in a lock. And when the spike protein hits that receptor and binds to it, that allows the virus to come into the cell and release its genetic material. That's how it gets in. Some of you said that, um, Some of you said that you had heard that there are mutations now in this virus, and those mutations are not unusual. Any time genetic material gets replicated, there's a chance that a mistake is going to get made. It's a natural thing. It happens all the time. So you can imagine that when there are billions of people literally around the world who are susceptible to this virus, Think of all the billions and billions and trillions and quadrillions of times this virus has been replicated. Mistakes get made. The enzymes make mistakes and mistakes get made and mutations occur. Some mutations don't matter, others do. And right now we have a couple of variants of this virus that have had mutations in the spike protein and have allowed it to bind even better to the ACE2 receptor. So all of the strains can bind to that receptor. That's how they get in the cell. But the, some of the new variants can bind really well. Think of it like, um, I, I, I use the analogy, think of how you have to um, plug um, a lightning cord into your cell phone or something, or you know, a power cord into your cell phone or into your computer. You can do it, right? The little end on the power cord fits into the slot on your device. You can do it. 
But think about how much easier it is when your power cord has a magnet in it. All I have to do is get this power cord near the port on my MacBook and the magnet draws it in. The mutations in this virus right now in the spike protein are like adding a magnet. It just allows the spike to find the receptor easier and bind really tightly. So it's a problem, it's a problem for us. And the longer this virus circulates among susceptible hosts, the longer it's gonna mutate. So we're kind of in a race now to get as many people around the world vaccinated as possible. Because once we have as many people as possible immune to the virus, the virus won't have any hosts and it will just drop down in numbers. We just won't have as much of it around. It will degrade. It needs susceptible people in order to stay around in high numbers. So we're really in a race now um, to get everybody vaccinated as quickly as possible. What do you think is the strangest thing? The thing that most that you find most bizarre about this virus or about the disease it causes? Put that in the chat for me. What do you think sitting here now in February, almost March, a year later, in your opinion, what do you think is the strangest fact about this virus or about this disease? that um, just seems bizarre to you. I know for me, um, I find it fascinating how so many people don't get sick from it. Yeah, very, very strange, right? We don't know exactly why yet, but I suspect we're gonna learn that different people may have different variations of that ACE2 receptor. Some people may have a version of that receptor that just doesn't bind very well to the virus. So they're a little less likely to get it. But only time will tell us. And the variations in symptoms. Oh, I totally agree, Mackenzie. How bizarre that two people who are the same age and have the same general health can have such a different outcome with this virus. Like how the heck are two 20 year old, strong, athletic people getting the virus? One of them doesn't have any symptoms at all and one of them drops dead from it. We just don't know yet. We don't know those answers. Yeah, Lacey, there's a lot of, um, as we all know, there's been a lot of um, controversy and a lot of discussion about public policy during this pandemic. Um, we all know that um, people are, um, it's very difficult for human beings to be told what they can and cannot do. And we didn't do a very good job over this past year of fighting through the misinformation about the virus. Um, we didn't do a very good job on a national scale of teaching people about this virus. And so what ended up happening was a lot of people don't eat, there are people that don't even think the virus is real, right? Um, we've had controversy over whether you should be forced to put cloth over your mouth or nose when you're out in public. Um, and there's been all kinds of um, arguments about what should be allowed to stay open, what is essential, and what shouldn't. You know, um, Target and Walmart, they've stayed open, right? And the, the argument was, well, they sell groceries. People must have food. But smaller stores are like, well, you know, Target also sells all the things I sell and now everybody's going to Target and I have to be closed and businesses have gone out and it's been really, really difficult, hasn't it? Restaurants have just suffered tremendously during this. People haven't had access to daycare and they haven't been able to go to work and 
it's been very, very difficult, very, very stressful. And um, hopefully, I am a, a, an optimistic person, hopefully we're gonna learn some things that will help us better prepare for the next pandemic. Um, hopefully we're gonna help um, support people better than we did this time. Um, very, very, very difficult year for everybody, including you guys, by the way. Um, I know it's been very hard, um, very strange to be thrown in to remote learning like this. Yeah. <laughs> Victoria's reminding us about the toilet paper. <laughs> that was so strange. The toilet paper that sold out at the start of the pandemic and everyone was like, what, what, what in the world? Why is there no toilet paper? It's just one of those things that we're learning about human nature. You know, when, a, when people hear that toilet paper is running low or that water is running low or bread is running low, they tend to run out and buy it. And they tend to buy much more than what they need. And we saw that total breakdown in the supply chain for toilet paper. It was bizarre. Hopefully, hopefully, um, we'll learn a lot from this pandemic that we can apply to the next one. And may that next one be centuries away. <laughs> but we have every reason to be hopeful right now because we are vaccinating. And um, historically, historically, all of the terrible diseases that have plagued humankind, um, we have managed to get under control with vaccination. So we have every reason to be very, very hopeful that this virus will be brought under control. I know we all wish it would happen tomorrow, but, um, but we're getting close. We're getting very close. All right, good job today, guys. Good job um, talking about this really important virus. We're gonna talk about this virus again. I'm gonna let you go because I've kept you too long, but um, we'll talk a little bit later in the semester. We'll talk about the vaccines one day and we'll talk about um, testing one day and um, we'll uh, keep an eye on things and uh, keep everybody updated. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna let you go. Um, we are not going to be meeting on Friday. So mark your calendars for that. All right, no meeting on Friday this week. I'll also send out an announcement just to remind everybody, but you'll have Friday morning to do some other work, <laughs> okay? All right, everybody, I'm gonna let you go. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs>